Shamikta, thank you for agreeing to talk to us about IPTA. I would start by asking, why was Indian People's Theatre Association formed? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, critical point, a juncture at which the IPT emerged along with the Progressive Writers Association. The two organizations came almost at the same time and under the same pressures. Uh, it was the 1940s, the Second World War was already on and uh, there had been a major political shift in 1942-43 with uh, Germany attacking the Soviet Union. And internationally, the communist movement spread all over the world and uh, taking a very leading role in the anti-colonial struggles in different parts of the world, in the different continents. Uh, there was a shift of focus, a kind of consensus circulated that for the time being fascism is the greater danger and therefore we can keep the anti-colonial conflicts in a state of abeyance for some time and resist fascism. And that led to a kind of alienation or isolation of the communist movement or the left movement as a whole from the mainstream anti-colonial struggle in India. The communist left got isolated because the Congress was pressing for a different kind of politics at that point of time from the feeling that since British power was cornered all over the world and also in India, why don't we take advantage of that and try to claim from the British rulers some more privileges, some more advantages and facilities and take a small step towards independence eventually. So with the communists taking a different kind of position, not taking part in the non-cooperation movement, there was this kind of crisis in the left. So separated or isolated from the political mainstream, the left chose to create a site for what I have started calling for the last four or five years, the cultural left, as a parallel to the political left. So if the political left is not in a position to play its militant role in the mainstream, let the cultural left fill in the gap and bring in the international perspective of the anti-colonial movement. That the anti-colonial movement in a single country is not a quote-unquote national venture, but it means much more than that. And particularly at a point where the realization was slowly dawning among the cultural left, which was defining itself, which was positioning itself in the late 1940s, that somehow the nationalist consensus that Gandhi had been driving at from 1917-1919 after his return to India, uh, all the major issues of conflict, class, caste, gender, all of these had been driven under the carpet to achieve a national consensus. And in the process, these were being marginalized with the assurance that once we have independence, these can be addressed, there will be time for that. But history doesn't 
work like that. You can't wish away, you can't marginalize, you can't throw away issues which are so vital and so central. So the cultural left found a fertile ground for thought, for cultural activism through the Progressive Writers Association and the IPTA. That's how I think the IPTA comes into being. The thought, the ideas may not have been that clear as I'm trying to put it now. But obviously these ideas were germinal to the growth of the IPTA in the 1940s. IPTA claimed IPTA's motto was people's theatre stars the people, right? So how successfully do you think IPTA productions, you know, uh, try to represent the contemporary reality in theatre as it emerged out of the democratic struggles of people against anti-imperialism A, B, anti-fascism. Uh, so I would want you to talk about the IPTA productions, the major ones. Before we go into the productions proper, I think another perspective uh, has to be brought into view. Now, you have to remember that the colonial intervention in our cultural history had created a massive rupture in the cultural production and the cultural processes of the country in a very big way. Primarily because the colonial knowledge package that we were offered with colonialism was essentially a product of the 18th century enlightenment. So the natural continuity of a cultural, I would call it a cultural stream, where music, dance, and the more verbally centered theater were part of one continuity, a seamless continuity which was ruptured and cracked up by the enlightenment divisiveness and classification, categorization, which came in the wake of enlightenment rationalism and scientism. With that, the natural cultural flow of the country was also disrupted when the new urban intelligentsia, the product of the colonial knowledge system in practice and application, they break off these things and the audiences are immediately broken off. As a result, let's face the fact that the so-called new theatre that emerged in the colonial period whether in its Parsi variation, or in its Sangeet Nataka variation, or in the Calcutta variation the commercial theater. of the commercial theatre, in all these variations, these theatres never found the larger public, the larger collectivity, which had nurtured cultural production pre-colonial. So this loss of the audience, the, the Calcutta Commercial Theatre, for example, was never, never, never a popular theatre with a wide enough reach. If you go into the history of that theatre, it's a history of failures followed by failures followed by failures. So what IPTA did before it went into productions as such, it went into creating what I would call a cultural platform or rather platforms 
and platforms that could circulate throughout the country, that could create variations. So the productions, the initial productions of diabetes, particularly Spirit of India or India Immortal and the several regional, local variations that grew around those models of the Spirit of India and India Immortal. What did these really offer as production? These are the first productions. Right. These are not plays, plays. per se. Right. Uh, what did they offer? They offered a view, a landscape of Indian culture in its and with its regional variations, giving the audience a perspective of the variety, the divergences, the different voices and the different bodies. I harp on the bodies rather than just the voices and I bring the two together because that was the IPTA project. And even that idea, beginning from the concept of the People's Theatre Stars the People, that the spirit of India or India immortal performance, call it a production, begins with Sari Jahase Acha put to a completely different tune by Pandit Ravi Shankar for the IPTA. Very different from the lilting lyrical ghazal, uh, which was its uh, earlier incarnation. So gives you that feel of an, of an India, of a Hindustan Hamara, and then showing the diversity of that Hindustan Hamara, not a singular national India. And the different bodies and the different voices and the different classes and the different cultures, the different regions, they all come into play on that platform. And this platform becomes also a kind of a model that the regions, when they start their productions, the work on that concept of a platform, rather than the theatre production or the musical production or the Sangeet Nataka production, which had been the models in the colonial period. So I think before we talk about Erna Banna or a play done by the Bombay IPTA or a variation or a, or a construction, reconstruction of the Burakatha in Andhra, we should talk of this concept of a platform. platform. Right. Now, but this concept of a platform and this carried on once the IPTA had brought the concept in, brought the model in, the production model of the platform into the scenario. It continued for years and even beyond the IPTA, when the IPTA was weakening, uh, falling apart in the late 1950s into the early 60s, the peace movement was a great cultural rallying point. And the peace movement also worked on and along the same project of providing a platform and offering a platform. For example, one of my early memories of, call it a production in a platform or projecting a platform through a production. One of my earliest memories go back to 1952 in Kolkata at the Muhammad Ali Park. A peace conference was being held and it was an evening, a cultural evening. And I remember very clearly and hauntingly, the evening begins with the legendary KC De Krishna Chandra De, the blind singer, singing uh, in his rich baritone uh, a D.L. Roy song, Jedin Shunil Jaladi Hoi Tiyo Thile Janani Bharata Followed by a song in Hindi, 
Himalaya Par Hai Desh Amara. Immediately followed by Kirod Nottu, mm -hmm. a drummer, a traditional dhol player, who had been uh, discovered by the IPTA and introduced to urban audiences. So Kirod Nottu comes and plays the dhol which represents a completely different cultural history, a class, a originality, very different from what the yes. earlier singer, yes. what Casey Day was offering. And these two items are followed by a full-fledged performance of Bohrupi's Chanatar. And incidentally, in that version of the Chanatar, which was later revised and truncated, uh, the first scene takes place in Kolkata with the lead, uh, with, with a role being played by Devabrutu Bishash, the legendary singer who appears. And he's a singer and his friend from the village, Rahimuddi, played by Shombhumitra, comes to meet him in Kolkata. Now, and, and comes to meet him after partition. So, you can see the situational politics That's of this scenario of a platform. Kesi De, Kirod Notto, Shombhu Mitra, Devabrutu Bishash. Now, this becomes more important in the short-lived rich history of IPT in the 40s, pre the ban 1948. Uh, more than the individual play productions or some musical productions, it was the concept of the platform, the travels of the platform. For example, when uh, IPTA uh, does the shorter Hindi version of Joban Bondi called Antima Bhilasha, which travels throughout India. And invariably as part of that platform, right. where yes. there would be songs, where there would be other items right. culminating in this Antima Bhilasha. Right. Right. So it's that uh, project platform, whatever you call it, that becomes the IPTA product, mm -hmm. its cultural product. Mm -hmm. right. In fact, uh, PC Joshi had started something called the Bhoka Hai Bengal campaign, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. which, which even traveled to Punjab mm -hmm. and the north of India with this. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as we are talking about the cultural platform, how much of it do you think because IPTA's project was to travel to the villages also, to involve those marginalized workers of the village, the agricultural laborers. How much do you think were they successful in making this cultural platform accessible or available, both to the urban and to the rural? I would say that uh, it was not a success story. There were several problems. A, it needed, and that was part of Joshi's vision also, and he was aware of this need very much, that it needed the local party organization to create this space, this opportunity, bring the audience in, because this is not an audience that would immediately identify with it, lap it up just like that. It was a product which was alien, culturally alien, a completely new model. Different idioms, languages coming into play. So there was that barrier, that question of unfamiliarity. However we idealize it or valorize it, this was a difficulty. Mm -hmm. a, a, a kind of an inaccessibility mm -hmm. at the ground root right. level, which you can't wish away. Right. Right. 
language is a barrier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Language is a problem. Absolutely. And different looks, different voices, mm. they are a problem. Mm. They're alien. Mm. Mm. So it needed a party apparatus to support it, to mobilize the people for it, organize it around it. Then this could go on. Somehow, from whatever history I've tried to recover or reclaim from my conversations with people of different generations throughout the country, uh, the party apparatus at the ground root was not prepared for that. Not even aware of, what is of the need for what I'm calling a cultural Culture. left. That awareness was not there at one point. The other problem was that when it was the urban artist, the artist with a capital A had already been defined, had gathered a kind of a cultural capital. With that, why should this artist demean himself to take on the discomforts of what you call the traveling. Traveling is never something that this new artist, the bourgeois artist with a capital A, accepts naturally. The contempt for the traveling theatre, the contempt for the Jatra, the contempt for the Pasi theatre, the contempt for the Sangeet Nataka tradition, which was so strongly embedded in the culture of the new intelligentsia, left intelligentsia, which moved into this space created by the cultural left. If you take the instance of somebody like Shombhu Mitra, who had emotionally, right from his origins, identified with the commercial theatre, chosen Shishir Bhaduri as his model, gone to Shishir Bhaduri, and came away from Shishir Bhaduri with the feeling that Shishir Bhaduri didn't recognize his genius or his quality. And he had to prove himself mm. to be right and prove Shishin Bhaduri wrong. Mm. That becomes almost a mission to him. Mm. But that will come slightly later when he can define it more strongly. But before that there is this phase when he comes into the IPTA that he had just uh, left it all together. He had become a tantric, in fact. He would go to the Kalikhat, uh, Burning Heart, spend hours there meditating with skulls and bones and things like that, uh, becoming extremely spiritual, but uh, holding on to his loyalty to the magic of the voice of the actor, the supremo, that he nurtures. And that's how Bijan Bhattacharya and Binay Ghosh discover him. After Bijan Bhattacharya had written his Joban Bundi and writing his Nobanno, and he is convinced, so is his friend Binay Ghosh, that this is a theatre that could not draw on the theatre of the Girish Shishir tradition. It had nothing to do with that. It had to capture the real, the real in its bloody nakedness. And that theatre was a no-no. At the same time, even as they were depending on actors who came from non-actorial backgrounds or non-actorial sentiments or feelings or desires, 
they needed a theatrical frame, a theatrical structure, something to hold all these acts together. And they were groping for that. And as they would go by, they would hear this rich voice intoning the D.L. Roy texts and the Kirut Prashad texts at 11 o'clock or midnight. And they went up to this man, identified this man, heard his story and said, told him, why don't you join us? You have had an experience in staging. So share with us that experience and let us build a different kind of theatre. Mm. And Shrambhu Babu joins IPTA but remains a marginal mm. by choice. choice. Provides them with what you can call conventional theatrical expertise mm. to a certain extent but stays out of it. Mm. For example, when I interviewed in the 1960s all the surviving actors of the original Nobanno, all of the surviving actors, I didn't miss out on anyone, uh, they were unanimous that the acting was given to them by Bijunda totally. Shrombu Babu was designing the staging and taking care of that. But once Nobanno works, I'm not describing it as a success as such, it works, it has its impact, tremendous impact. Uh, the first clash with the IPTA comes when Shombu Mitro insists that Nobanno can't travel. Nobanno shouldn't travel. It can have its theatrical perfection, its staging artistry perfect, only with a revolving stage. And it's the art of theatre that comes first, and all this rest can come after. So basically it is the individual artist and the individual artist is so much of the cultural politics that had generated and come into its own by the time, thanks to colonial education, our exposure through the colonial system, a very carefully moderated delivery system of knowledge, that somehow the IPTA model of an open and free platform, a traveling platform, but the travels have to be carried on, monitored, handled organizationally. And any, 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 any left intervention in history, any left mobilization demands organization. So the clash between the individual and the organization, the organization being treated as a, a promoter of the individual, as a projector of the individual, rather than the organization organizing the individuals creating a collective, exactly. a new people, a new constituency mm -hmm. right. for the performing collective, mm -hmm. creating these constituencies, which is an act of mm -hmm. organization. organization. Yeah. True. True. And the fact remains that somehow the party apparatus was not conscious of the great political need at that point of the cultural left and its functioning. And I seriously think that this is an issue which has to be 
re-explored, re-presented once again at this critical juncture. First is if you could talk about Nobanno, because you have extensively written about Nobanno, about Vijan Babu. And the second thing is, we'll come to the party and the culture politics. Uh, you have spoken about it, but uh, whether it was really responsible for uh, you know the IPTA's failure, whether really party inter intervention was a cause why IPTA failed. But I think we'll talk about Nobanno first. In the 1960s, I, uh, from my studies in theatre, I felt the need to study Nobanno very closely. And I was instrumental in uh, reopening the Nobanno story in a way because I'd come close to Bijunda personally at that point of time and I tried to probe uh, the Nobanno story with Bijunda helping me out and being such a great support and such a great friend. Uh, the story as it emerged, the Nobanno story, and I was instrumental in um, leading on to a fresh publication of a new edition of Nobanno with, <clears throat> with a more correct uh, checked script and uh, a long introduction that I provided based on these interviews and my research on Nobanno. Now, in the process, the Nobanno that I rediscovered and tried to historicize, for Bijonda, theater did not exist. Theater did not matter in any way whatsoever in 1943. What mattered to him? He was a committed communist, a card-holding communist. He was a natural singer with some training in classical music. Did his riyas quite systematically, regularly, out of whatever he had learnt. He was a journalist, he was a story writer, he was a poet, a lyricist, and a composer, drawing on a large repertoire of folk musical traditions because he loved Traveling, and he had traveled extensively as a reporter, <clears throat> as a journalist. And I would say that the communist journalist, as an institution, plays a very important part in the making of what I call the cultural left in the sense that these journalists love traveling. Traveling becomes a major mode of gathering news and making a new politics out of the gathering of news itself. The gathering of news is a political act for these communist journalists a very strongly committed act. And this is something that I gathered from and learned from my exchanges with both Bijunda and Shubhash Mukhopadhyay. Both of them were very clear in their perceptions in the 1940s of the need for travel news gathering, bringing the news, bringing the story of the living, the existence, 
the big thing mm. of a large mass of people who are not covered mm. by the uh, knowledge areas, mm. the knowledge fields defined and set down and charted out by the colonial knowledge system. So both Bijonda and uh, uh, Shubhash Mukhopadhyay Later on, even somebody like uh, Shiddhish Shoshin, the poet, journalist with whom I had the joy and privilege of working when I worked in Shadinata, all of them brought this culture of the traveling, news gathering, left journalist. And bringing in all that information and turning that into a literature. Bijunda, in the form of his songs and plays, Shubhashta in the form of his great prose writings from Ahmad Bangla and beyond. Yes. Okay. Uh, also Gulam Kuddus I should mention, uh, walking with a march traveling miles from an industrial town to Calcutta to bring in their grievances and demands and a communist journalist traveling, literally walking with them and reporting it, recording it, mm -hmm. making it part of a larger literature, a body of mm -hmm. uh, writing. Mm -hmm. So Bijunda was very much part of this process. Theatre didn't mean anything to him at all. In fact, what he told me that he hadn't watched uh, theater in Shambhazar okay. ever. Okay. There were these rare occasions mm -hmm. when there would be a theater performance and the, 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 the Shambhazar theater traveled very little mm -hmm. around the 30s mm -hmm. and 40s for various reasons. Uh, but on the rare occasions when they would be traveling to some district town or somewhere he had seen Shishi Bhaduri, right. but not at Sarangam. Mm. Mm. And he admired Shishi Bhaduri, but from a distance. It was not right. uh, his area of interest. Right. He was not interested in theatre. But he tells me this moving story of the famine of 1943-44, when he has to walk every day, every morning, from his Dien Mitro Square place, close to the Dien Mitra Square, a small park, uh, he has to walk by the park to go to his tram stop, take the tram and go to the Ananda Bazar Patrika office where he was employed at that point of time. Uh, even while feeding information and news to uh, John Ajuddo, mm -hmm. the party daily, the party weekly, sorry. Uh, as he walked along every day, he told me about this settlement of the famine stricken that had taken shelter, one shouldn't say shelter because there, there was, was no shelter. shelter. It was under the sky and under the sun uh, in that park. Mm -hmm. And Mitunda told me as he passed by, he said, I never had the guts, I never had the courage to look at them. The shame of it, the shame of this thing happening before my eyes and me witnessing it and not being able to do anything about it, mm. not change things in the least. Mm. This was such a shame that I didn't dare, I didn't have the guts to look at them. So every day I pass them, I would be looking to the ground. And one day, as I was crossing them, I hear a man and a woman talking and laughing and joking about the fun that they had had the previous year during Nobanno, 
when the first harvest had come in. And now somebody had cut a practical joke on another and the great fun they had about it. <laughs> he passed by. Three days later as he was passing by, he saw a dead body under tattered rags and in a flash it struck him it could be the man who was speaking the other day. And that gave a kind of a shock and he felt they should talk, they should speak for themselves. I do not have the right to speak for them. But how can they? And what can I do about it? And that's when for the first time in his life he tells me he thought maybe a play where I try to bring in their voices and give the voices buddhas. So a man comes to theatre from this sort of a realization where the real has to be represented. Nothing else matters. This is the take off point, the trigger. And the first thing he decides when he starts working on writing plays. First Agun, then Jaban Bondi, then Nabannu. Trying to get the hang of writing a play before he can write Nabannu. He needs to learn the thing. So in this learn, even as he goes through this learning process, he is determined that he won't have actors, <laughs> trained actors, because the actors have been corrupted in that process. I need human beings with experiences and with a desire to identify towards representation. And he realized that it is a very difficult process to identify and then to represent, not just play the identification. And he was prepared to go the whole hog, learn that process through practice. So it had to begin with the choice of the performance. One of his choices was Tripti Mitra, whom also I extensively interviewed as part of my Anubhanda project. And what came out and what went into the making of Nabanno. When I asked Triptidhi what she had desired to be in life, she smiled and said, I wanted to be a, a doctor. I love helping people and help people to heal. But if I couldn't be a good enough student, then I would be happy to be a nurse. I wouldn't mind it. That was the scope of her desire. desire. So when Bijunda chooses Triptidhi, mm. uh, one can see the vibes. And uh, Triptidhi shared with me these two experiences which I've often spoken about and repeated. Experience one, uh, she was living at that point of time on uh, Shodan on the road as a house guest with an uncle mm -hmm. of hers, Shrutindranath Mujumdar, an outstanding left-wing journalist of the period, editing the Ananda Bazaar at that point of time in a way Bijunda's employer. Uh, 
And Abhijanda was related to Triptidhi also, it was the same family. And that's how Abhijanda had picked up Triptidhi. But Triptidhi tells the story of how she lived in this big joint family, studying in Ashutosh College in Calcutta. And the way it happened those days, people from small towns or villages who had made it big in the city, they would be following a kind of an open doors policy where relations, even distant relations or people in the village, if they would like to come down to Calcutta looking for a job or studying in college for two years or four years, they could stay on with this person. And this is how Triptidhi had landed up in Shruti Mujumdar's house on Shodhan on the road. And it was a joint family, retainers, uh, family people, kinspersons, etc, etc, etc. So about 20 or 30 people together would have their lunch, would have their dinner, etc. And the lunch would be cooked at a particular point of time, afternoon. And by then, Triptidhi had done her classes in Ashutosh College, which was a morning college for the women, the women's department, and the day was for the males. So she would finish her classes, come back, time for lunch, and the lunch would be cooked then, and the rice would be done together for all these people, all the dependents, and the extra water of the rice would be poured out from a first floor or second floor kitchen. And it would drain down the water pipe outside the house and drop into the open drain on the street. And just opposite the house, on the other side of the road, there was a small opening where again uh, some of these refugees, famine refugees had taken shelter. And it was almost a ritual and she would stand in the terrace, Sriptidhi would stand and watch it and bear the pain also every day where some of the women from over there would come rushing as the water started pouring down, dripping, and they would carry their small animal bowls and gather the water, the rice water, and go back and use it for their food. This was a daily ritual, but one day there was a departure. She was standing there watching the scene, and a woman comes up, a woman who had three little children there, leaves them and rushes, gathers the water in the bowl, crosses, goes back, the children rush up to her, they encircle her, they wrap her up, she just ruthlessly pushes them away. They literally fall, the three of them. And she takes the bowl to her lips and she starts drinking it up. The children don't cry. They stare in amazement. Something like this had never happened with their mother. They can't take it. They do not know how to deal with it. They don't cry. And that's the first thing that shocks Triptidhi, that they don't cry. And then when the woman is almost finished draining it out, she realizes what she has done for the first time. She has been so hungry that she hadn't been able to eat. She realizes what she has done, but it's finished already. She looks at it, there's nothing there. She looks to the children, pleadingly, they come up and they wrap her up once again and she breaks into tears. 
this is one scene one whole dramatic scene a piece of theater and the other scene around three o'clock Triptidi would be part of a makeshift camp in Hazrapat next to Ashutosh College, close to Shradhananda Road, where the members of the Students' Federation, the women's, a women's group affiliated to the Students' Federation, volunteers, they would cook and provide a gruel to about 30 odd women every day around 3 o'clock and that one day when she was serving the gruel and these women were sitting in a circle very disciplined and she had a bucket and the gruel was there and she was pouring out into their bowls they all had their own bowls as she was walking up, she looked at the face of one of those women and she had an eerie feeling, something wrong. She kept the bucket aside, walked up, rushed up and stretched out her arm and the woman fell on her arm and passed away. The other women would tell Triptidi later that she had been starving for five days at a stretch and they had picked her up and they had brought her along to share the food. She couldn't wait for that. So Triptidi told me these stories and told me at once that when she acted in Nobanno these memories stayed with her, stuck to her, and she had two feelings or two ideas which she tried to put across very clearly. She said, one, I had to convey an and share that experience with my audience, of course, I would do that, try to do that, that pain, that horror that I felt. But two, they must be prepared to give the money at the end of the show when I went down and gathered their contributions because we had to buy the stuff to cook the gruel for next day. So these two ideas remain together for every performance of Nobanno that I performed. And it was Bijanda who taught me how to speak the words and how to use my body and of course those memories would be working around within my body. I didn't have any trained actorial skills to bring into it. But the, ma, but the authenticity that Bijunda treasured and tried to put into us and the politics of that entire situation that gave me the act and this was true for somebody like Charu Prakash Ghosh, Gopal Haldar, Shobha Shen, Monika Chakraborty, all of whom I interviewed. So, a very different kind of handling, projecting, theatricalizing the real. 
And this theatricalization of the real, in the case of Nabanno, reached a kind of poetry which if you don't read through the text and the language because the language itself takes body that is how Bijunda felt about it and that is the kind of theatre that Bijunda was trying to create in Nobanno and later on also in all his works Jiyon Konna, Mora Chand, Kotrantor, Devi Korchon, Gorbhubuti Jonani, Hash Khalir Hash, Cholu Shagure, in all these plays. But something that remained a loner's voyage, the IPTA didn't follow him. He was carrying it on as a lonely mission and drew in different kinds of people in the trajectory. But again and again, he found people, he discovered people who were prepared to take that risk, who were non-actors, no actors, but would join in in the performance and live that performance through. In fact, at one point, it, 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 it may sound very uh, funny and absurd, uh, for the Lenin uh, centenary in the 70s sometime, uh, Bijunda uh, translated this uh, Russian play by Nikolai Pogodin mm. called Kremlin Chimes mm. and he wanted to do it for the Lenin centenary and uh, I need a good Lenin but I, I can't take any actor. Mm. How can an actor do Lenin? <laughs> so his first choice, an extremely stupid choice, was me. <laughs> so I said, no, 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 I can't because, no, you have to do it because you have read Lenin, you know Lenin and you can do Lenin. And I said, no, I can't mm -hmm. because I'm a stammerer. I'm a lousy stammerer and I, I can't. Mm -hmm. So ultimately I, I, I managed to persuade him. So then his next choice was Badal Sarkar. Okay. And uh, Badal Bhu did come for two or three of the rehearsals, but they but the thing didn't materialize where so it fell off. So that kind of a madness, but a madness for the authentic, mm. exactly. which should have been mm. one of the pursuits of the cultural left yeah. I was just about and to ask you. the IPTA. Right. So These are the visionary utopics that the IPTA should have uh, caught on to. Mm. Exactly. Whereas IPTA post 50s, post ban, mm. Mm. became a kind of a bandwagon Absolutely. for stars, celebrities who had some strains of conscience and they felt well here is a bandwagon we can jump onto that and the IPT would grab them make heroes of them so all that the IPT had started as being against yeah it stood for it doesn't play the they now become through a kind of strange, ironic reversal. So now IPTA swears by the Rittig Khattaks and Balrat Sanis, etc, etc, etc. IPTA had another agenda. The 
revival of folk forms, you know. And I think it is more evident in the Ganeshangit uh, part of the Ipta. But uh, when one reads Bijan Babu, one can't uh, mm -hmm. neglect really the traditional forms or the folk mm -hmm. forms or the mm -hmm. kind of, as you mentioned, the use of language, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I have read Bijan Babu's interview where he says that after every two kilometers, the language, language changes. changes, right? So all of this is what people's theatre should have been, right? The theatricalization of the reality of the people and not of this artistic ego that you were talking about. More or less know what happened. You said that it became a bandwagon and people went up to it. But do you think that whatever uh, folk forms today we want to celebrate or the kind of folk forms that we can today recognize even that, you know, this is this and this is that, was it partly due to the project of IPTA, you know, this revisiting folk forms after, uh, after the colonial intervention and bringing them up to the stage in this variety of programs that you were talking about? The platform. Yes, the platform. So do you think that uh, IPTA's, there is some amount of, uh, we should give it some due that IPTA was able to bring these two uh, it's a problematic question yes. for me in the sense that now again uh, I'd go back to the concept of the platform and also the central squad yes because the central squad was the site where quote-unquote folk artists and urban artists and people from the working class and uh, party activists, whole timers in the party, they would share a commune and a commune with all the uh, overtones, associations, etc, etc of the communist vision or the communist hypothesis. The commune is so central to it. Living a communist life, living communism. So it was part of that. But right from the beginning, uh, if you read, you must have read because you've read your stuff, you must have read Rebadi's yes. uh, wonderful yes. autobiography. And uh, there, very casually and very honestly, Rebati says that since Robi Shankar and Annapurna yes. and the young child, they were living there, Rebati and others, they naturally felt that they should be washing <laughs> their, their utensils, utensils for them. Yeah. Mm. So already in the commune, Mm. the divisions mm. and nobody really in the organization mm. in the party now if you are really thinking of a commune mm. Mm. and a real commune then try to explore its utopics Absolutely. this was not being done mm. Mm. so the politics was lacking already so the folk performers who were coming in were being fast transformed into the bourgeois artist with a capital A. Because it was already there. The design was already there. The design was already there. And then so the larger vision, the larger program, the larger program of the cultural left, of the cultural platform, that the whole country would be able to share, that all the classes would be able to share. And uh, the knowledge, the awareness of other peoples, all this was being eroded from within, right from the beginning, with the performance becoming central 
the show. Show, exactly. The big show. Mm -hmm. And I have serious problems at that point. I would like uh, to argue someday with somebody who has uh, studied the Joshi case, the Joshi instance, the Joshi biography, the Joshi history more carefully than me. But I'd like to understand how things started going wrong with Joshi. Because what I find when I talk to Shombu Babu or even Rit Ritpika is in writing also, recently re reading it, it became Joshi's focus at that point to individuate them as artists, mm -hmm. give them special treatment, mm -hmm. so that Shombu Babu, till the end of his life, would say, it was Joshi who understood us. Or Rittik, mm -hmm. in his uh, late Bangladesh phase, mm -hmm. in a letter, he writes to Shorama, Shorama quotes it, that I met Joshi after a long time and he kissed me and said, you are the only genuine artist. Mm -hmm. Now, so things were going, so, so even Joshi must have fallen into that trap and that bandwagon trap rather than the platform where these artists, my Shombhu Mitra, my Raj Kapoor, my Balrat Sahani, my Dina Gandhi, I present them and they feel, they also feel gratified for a time that I'm for the people, with the people, working with the people. I am the people's voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the process, the people get marginalized mm -hmm. once again, a second time. Absolutely. Where their voice, their representation mm -hmm. is taken away from them. Right. And so I this process, I think, sets in mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. in that phase. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes so easy in the 1950s, when the Nehruvian state has a state policy for culture, the people who uh, exercise that policy, the people who carry that policy out, in the front row, mm -hmm. there are the IPTA I people. Exactly. It's Shantagan Shantagandhi, it's... Uh, Shanta Gandhi, uh, Shochin Shen Gupto of the IPTA, Nirmala Joshi, Nemi Chandra Jain. Dina was also there. Dina was there, very much Bhagat there. Sahani, Shombhu Mitra. Shombhu Mitra. They are the people whom the state immediately takes up appropriates. Immediately. Because they have no other model to follow. Also. No other model. Exactly. Yeah, no other model. And I, I have always, I always... So I now started, just a minute, I now have very serious reservations about the word folk and the associations and the concepts that have grown around hmm. it. Hmm. In my classes at JNU, I don't use the word folk. Right. Very consciously. Now to come to uh, possibly almost concluding questions, what do you think, because you have uh, studied so much of uh, history of uh, theatre in India, you have engaged with these people, what do you think could have been a possible way of promoting people's theatre in India? You know? how, how do you envision one? One is travelling, which you were certainly suggesting, and how, what do you think could have been. What was, the, what was necessary, and, and this I am harping on more and more, is that if there had been a clearer conception of the cultural left and the political left, and what could be the relationship between the two. For example, now, when we have more access to a uh, literature materials, documents of the early revolutionary uh, Soviet Union uh, before Lenin's death. Uh, 
the kind of role that somebody like Markovsky plays, Marhol plays. Wait, I was going to talk about So the area, so, so, so this wonderful thing about Marhold, where Marhold is branching off from the Stanislavski kind of realism mm -hmm. to giving realism a body mm -hmm. rather than just a culture of memories mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing which has to be there but give it also a body Absolutely. so while he's experimenting with that Somehow, there is in that phase, particularly with the role that Lunacharsky and Maxim Gorky played at that point of time, and the kind of respect, the kind of recognition that the party party gives to them, <laughs> in that process, for a short-lived history, uh, Mayerhold says that Manhood is given, is allowed the space to experiment and Stanislavski offers him his first studio. Look at that. Yes. The bigness, the generosity of this man and the institution opening up. Opening up. Mm. It's not just an individual choice, it's an institutional choice right. also. Right. And Marhold experimenting there and Marhold being given the responsibility of setting up the palaces of culture mm. all over the Soviet Union. Mm. <laughs> and the concept of the palace of culture is identify a place and situate mm. yourself there, mm. gather its culture and give it a palace. Mm. Mm. And Marhol travels mm. throughout Russia, mm. locating, identifying these sites, these areas, mm. going into their histories, exploring their cultural histories, mm. and setting up the models for the first palaces of culture. Mm. So he says that here I am serving you, you as a loyal member of the party, as a follower of the party. This is a political program. So this is my role in the political left. I am taking instruction straight from the party. And the party is giving me the support, the institutional support, the local support, the organizational support. I can't do it by myself as an adventurer. But Back in Moscow, I still have my other site, my other space, where I give cultural left a body, a place, and I am preparing an audience, I am preparing a constituency for a later phase, when this culture, the political culture grows and there would be associations and conjunctions. That is something and that is something to which I think we should still try to go back to. Right. right. Thank you so much Shamikta. Lovely talking to you.